Taxpayers and Association. Uh, I'd ask the members if we could go uh, one question at a time. If we have time, we'll, we'll circle back around. But we're about 40 minutes off schedule currently, and I'd like to be respectful for the testifiers who are spending their day with us. Mr. Baldinger, you're not new to us. Thank you for joining us again. And I know that you'll be concise with your testimony, and we appreciate your passion for the issue. Yeah, so well, thank good, you. Good, and good, good morning. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Welcome. My name is David Baldinger, and I'm here today representing the Pennsylvania Coalition of Taxpayer Associations, an affiliation of 72 grassroots taxpayer advocacy organizations from across the state. First of all, I want to thank my, offer my thanks to the members of the House Finance Committee for giving me the opportunity to testify today on behalf of the PCTA about House Bill 1776. Today I'd like to discuss the benefits of HB 1776 as we see them, a few of the objections to the plan, and the results of research done by the PCTA members and others. I'm sure you're all aware, as Chairman Benninghoff said, of the extreme pressure on homeowners of all ages and they're facing because of relentlessly rising school property taxes. Our research has shown that as many as 10,000 Pennsylvanians lose their homes to property tax share of sales each year, and that total doesn't include those who sell, sometimes at a loss, to avoid losing their equity through such an event. As one supporter recently wrote to me, my husband and I are senior citizens and every year it becomes harder for us to pay our school taxes. We have paid our school taxes since 1965 and our fear is that one of these years we will be unable to do so and will have to move from the home where we raised our children. Completely eliminating the school property tax through House Bill 1776 is a giant step toward giving these homeowners peace of mind and forever ending the unconstitutional seizure of their property. But the damage caused to homeowners is only the very tip of the property tax iceberg. Walmart notwithstanding, 80% of non-government jobs in Pennsylvania are provided by small businesses. As the second biggest fixed expense for these job creators, the property tax, through its uncertain nature, discourages small business expansion and hinders job growth. A small business owner from York County recently wrote this, as a small company owner in the auto and truck repair trade that already has five workers, we were looking to open a second branch in York. We would have been able to hire at least three to five more people to run the second location. The monthly lease payment was $2,000, but then our lawyer found that the school taxes would be $23,000 per year. We have now put the brakes on opening a second branch in Pennsylvania, and we have been looking at other states to open our new location. The enactment of House Bill 1776 would give these entrepreneurs a well-deserved break and would allow them to expand their businesses and create much-needed jobs in Pennsylvania. And through Keystone Opportunity Zones, we already know that targeted property tax abatements attract new business to Pennsylvania. Why not eliminate the property tax and welcome new businesses by making the entire state a KOZ? In a February 29, 2012 Tax Foundation comparative analysis of state tax costs on business, a measure of business friendliness, Pennsylvania was ranked number 49 of 50 for new firms and dead last at number 50 for mature established firms. Not only is Pennsylvania's tax burden, which includes the property tax, discouraging new businesses and the jobs they create from locating here, it's also driving existing businesses and their jobs from Pennsylvania. Please see the chart from the Tax Foundation on page 6 and additional supporting information from businesses on pages 7 to 9 of my written testimony. Agriculture, Pennsylvania's largest industry, is being decimated by the property tax as farms that have been in families for generations are being sold acre by acre by owners who trade their land for property tax payments. A few months ago during one of my presentations about HP 1776 to a group in Monroe County, a woman told me how her father, the Christmas tree farmer, has sold 30 of his 40 acres piecemeal in the past 10 years simply to pay his property tax. And at the Capital Property Tax Independence Rally on May 7th, another farmer from Luzerne County talked about selling homemade baked goods in addition to his farming to raise enough money simply to pay his property tax. Farming. Pennsylvania's heritage and its lifeblood is being destroyed by the property tax. This could end now with the enactment of HB 1776. The housing market is at a standstill in Pennsylvania. 
During our research, realtors have told us that through the elimination of the greatest portion of the monthly property tax escrow, an amount in some areas that can equal the amount of the mortgage payment, Pennsylvania's real estate market would explode with new buyers. Thousands of young families who now cannot afford their piece of the American dream could almost immediately become homeowners by the elimination of the school property tax escrow through HB 1776. But besides the benefits to taxpayers, HB 1776's advantages for schools need to be considered. With a downturn in the housing market, many school districts have lost substantial revenue through assessment appeals by both homeowners and businesses. Here's just a couple of examples. Chester Schools, $180,000 annual loss from a single appeal by a shopping mall. Why a Missing Schools, $250,000 annual loss through a single appeal by a nursing home. Upper Marion Schools, $2 million annual loss through a single appeal by a manufacturer. And these are only a few examples of many throughout Pennsylvania. On April 17th, the school district business manager from Montgomery County wrote to me saying, Our district is the poster child for property owner-initiated tax assessment appeals. We have lost $94 million in assessed value in the past year alone. This translates into $1.7 million in revenue lost just since last year. We have over 50 cases pending in the court system as well. In Monroe County, it's not unusual for property taxes on a $200,000 home to exceed $10,000. Because of this tax burden, more than 3,000 homes are unoccupied and are generating no property taxes resulting in huge revenue losses to the schools. HB 1776 can end the uncertainty of property tax revenues and stabilize school funding for the benefit of all Pennsylvania school children. And finally, imagine for a moment the stimulus to Pennsylvania's economy as $10 billion in homestead property taxes is returned to the hands of homeowners to spend as they please. In short, the Property Tax Independence Act would not only relieve an unfair burden on homeowners, but will also serve as a massive economic stimulus, encourage small business development and expansion, and create jobs for Pennsylvanians. House Bill 1776 would foster an economic climate where every resident can grow and thrive. In the interest of being proactive, I'd also like to refute three of the most common objections to the legislation. The most commonly heard objection is that the numbers don't work. We'll know for certain when the Appropriations Committee issues its fiscal note but in the meantime, it's sufficient to say that throughout the crafting of HB 1776, the numbers were constantly compared and revised to conform to figures supplied by the House Appropriations Committee staff and the governor's 2012-2013 budget book. Because of this ongoing fiscal diligence, I am convinced that the plan is financially sound. The second most common objection is the loss of school board local control. HB 1776 contains no mandates of any kind and schools are free to use the replacement funding in any manner they wish. And school boards will still have the option to levy a local earned income tax if it is approved through voter referendum. But the most puzzling objection I've heard recently is that because of the retained debt provision of HB 1776, property taxes will remain after the two-year phase-out period. While this is true, what is not generally mentioned is that for a large majority of Pennsylvania school districts, debt service is less than 10% of their total budget. This means that almost all Pennsylvania homeowners will see an immediate property tax reduction of 90% or better until the existing debt is satisfied, and then the remainder of the property tax will disappear completely. Previous property tax elimination plans call for servicing existing debt from the state level, but many taxpayers from frugal school districts rightfully objected to paying for debt incurred by high-spending districts. Requiring each school district to service its own debt is by far the fairest method to address this issue while still promptly allowing almost total school property tax elimination. Finally, please consider the broad-based taxpayer acceptance of House Bill 1776. In the last year alone, our statewide taxpayer coalition has grown from 39 participating groups to the current 72. This growth is a clear evidence of continued and expanding support of House Bill 1776. For almost all property tax relief legislation that has been offered in the past, the sponsoring lawmaker has invariably talked about my plan. What differentiates House Bill 1776 from other property tax plans is that it is our legislation. Throughout the development of the bill, 
The prime sponsor conferred extensively with his House colleagues so he could incorporate their input. But equally important is the grassroots taxpayer group's continuing involvement. From the earliest discussions of this legislation in November 2010, the PCTA has been a full partner in the drafting of the Property Tax Independence Act. House Bill 1776 is truly a collaborative effort between lawmakers and the taxpayers who support it, and because of this collaboration, has gained widespread acceptance by residents from across the Commonwealth. On April 3rd, the Reading Eagle newspaper polled its readers about the Property Tax Independence Act. 90% of the respondents agreed with the provisions of the legislation. On April 11th, KQV Radio in Pittsburgh conducted a similar poll that resulted in 85% approval. And in a multiple choice poll conducted by the York Dispatch that was published on May 15th, only 8.5% of the respondents disagreed with the provisions of House Bill 1776. Screen captures of these polls are available on pages 10 through 12 of my written testimony for your reference. House Bill 1776 is solid, effective legislation with bipartisan support from 70 co-sponsors that has captured the, the enthusiasm and approval of Pennsylvania taxpayers. Through its enactment, this legislation can serve to not only remove an oppressive burden from Pennsylvania homeowners, but also can have positive, far-reaching effects on Pennsylvania schools, business climate, job growth, and our Commonwealth's economy in general. The Pennsylvania Coalition of Taxpayer Associations strongly urges the members of the House Finance Committee to swiftly vote for approval of HB 1776 for the benefit of all Pennsylvanians. Thank you very much for this opportunity and for your time and attention. I'll respond to any questions if you have any. Thank you, sir. You're very welcome. If we could solve this problem as swiftly and uh, efficiently as you went through five pages of testimony, we'd be in good shape and probably all reelected pretty quickly. Uh, you did a great job, and I appreciate you summarizing as well as you did. And I will say I actually agree with the changes in this particular portion of the bill that um, calls for the servicing of the debt on the local level rather than the state. I think that was pretty egregious for a lot of us, and I think that makes it a lot more attractive. I appreciate you highlighting it. I think our first question comes from Representative Denlinger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Mr. Ballinger. Good to have you back with us. Thank you. Um, I know you have spent much effort in, on this topic, and, and I appreciate that. I want to share that with you. Within the taxpayer groups that you've referenced, um, I'm going to ask. I'm going to play devil's advocate here for a minute and say, Please. what what point of angst or what what points of concern with this plan? do you hear from your own membership? Obviously, I'm sure there's a diversity of views on various items, such as expansion of the SUT uh, and certain categories there, perhaps, the raising of the rate, raising of the PIT. What, what point of contention is there within the taxpayer groups? I know this is going to sound unbelievable, but actually there is none. We have discussed this internally, the 72 groups, the entire time the bill was being crafted. What my, I was the point man on this with Representative Cox, but I represented the thoughts and the opinions of everybody within the taxpayer group. We are, 72 groups are totally united in this effort, and we stand for everything that is in this legislation. I guess, you know, as someone who has also spent some effort on this in some years, one frustration that I, that I run into is, you know, everybody's for elimination. But there's this presumption that somehow they're not going to end up paying anything. You know, that there's just this disconnect from the, the realization that teacher salaries have to be paid, the, the buses have to run, the lights have to be on. And, and perhaps you share that frustration. I don't know. But I would appreciate any comments you can share with us as members as we approach this issue. Is there a disconnect from the reality that there is a $10 billion bill to be paid here for education? I think in some cases, yes. However, I've given the, the talk on HB 1776 close to 50 times in the past year. I pull no punches. I tell exactly the way Representative Cox did this morning. But people are very accepting of it. They are so concerned about the property tax that they are not concerned about some of the provisions of the bill that might not be exactly to their liking. They, they understand that there is a $12.7 billion hole to be filled here, and it has to be filled somehow. And yes, they're going to pay other taxes. But by and large, what we're doing is spreading the burden from 3.2 million homeowners to 12.7 million residents plus visitors. 
and we always use a simple formula to tell the homeowners how to roughly figure it out. Now, obviously, it doesn't account for all the aspects of the bill, but take your school property tax bill, divide by 0 .07, which is the amount of the sales tax. That gives you roughly what you're going to have to spend on newly taxed items and services to equal the amount of property tax eliminated. The example I always like to use, because it's pretty close to the statewide average, a $3,500 property tax bill, you would have to spend $50,000 on newly taxed items and services to equal the amount of taxes that been eliminated. You give that number to a taxpayer, suddenly the light bulb goes off over their head and they understand how this works. And for most people in the state, it's, defi it's a definite benefit for them. One, one last question for you, if I may. Uh, some amount of the challenge we've had for decades, frankly, on this issue is geopolitical. Uh, Pennsylvania is a very diverse state and specifically diverse with regard to school financing. Uh, in your experience with the groups, is the growth in areas where this is at the top one or two of the hot button political issues a little less so in areas that um, perhaps are more modest in their property taxation? Our growth has been, for want of a better word, horseshoe-shaped across the state, starting in the northeast, down across south central, and up into the northwest. Um, northern, tiers, northern tier counties, not so much, but definitely that ring, starting northwest to northeast, is where we've had, and especially in the northwest, is where we've had most of our growth. And I think that's understandable because the movement started for us in the southeast and grew from there. The majority of our growth over the past year has very definitely been in the West and Southwest. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Very Chairman. Welcome. Thank you, Representative Daniel Lear. Representative Dean. You know what? I'm going to pass on my time. My question was answered. Thank you. Thank you, Brevity. We thank you as well. Anyone else? Thank you, Mr. Boldinger. We appreciate your hard work on this and your testifying here with us today. Yes. Next, we have Greg. Herb, Legislative Chair of Pennsylvania Association of Realtors, and whoever else from their association wants to join him. Comfortable, sir, go ahead and begin. Good morning, Chairman Benninghoff and Chairwoman Mundy and members of the House Finance Committee. My name is Greg Herb, and I have been in the real estate business for over 30 years. I am the Legislative Chair of the Pennsylvania Association of Realtors and previously served as the association president in 2009. On behalf of the 28,000 realtors in Pennsylvania, I'm here to present testimony on property tax reform. The Pennsylvania Association of Realtors is a strong advocate for private property rights and home ownership. We are not here to present support or opposition on, on any property tax reform proposals currently under consideration by the General Assembly. In order to gain a better understanding of the Pennsylvanians' views on property tax reform, PAR commissioned its own company, Keystone Analytics, to survey voters throughout the Commonwealth. While PAR does not make policy decisions based solely on the opinions of voters, we believe that in decisions as important as property tax reform, someone must give voice to the voters and homeowners of Pennsylvania and PAR is a natural entity to do just that. Keystone Analytics polled 500 voters in Pennsylvania, 87% of whom are homeowners, on May 13th and 14th of 2012. The results show that Pennsylvanians believe reforming and reducing property taxes should be a priority. 59% believe property taxes are either in part or wholly a state issue, and we demonstrated that on the graph to my right, to your left. When asked to rank the list of current state legislative priorities, 23% of Pennsylvanians picked reforming and reducing property taxes over balancing the state budget, improving roads and bridges, and dealing with illegal immigration. Based on the overall sentiment that Keystone Analytics has tracked over the past few years on tax taxation issues, it appears that voters are growing more and more weary of inaction by the state government on property tax reform. <laughs> property tax reform is on the minds of many Pennsylvanians. Our survey shows that 57% of homeowners believe that their property taxes are too high. Nearly 40% have seen increases of more than $50 in their total property tax bill in the last year. 
and more than 50% say it has contributed to their family's financial strain. Those surveyed were asked to comment regarding some of the recent property tax reform proposals. 62% of Pennsylvania surveyed believe that increasing the sales tax by 1% and broadening, the, and broadening the base tax would be a favorable alternative to funding public schools if the schools would receive the same amount of revenue regardless of tax source. Of those surveyed, 56% don't believe that giving local governments the option of reducing property taxes by levying a sales tax and use and occupancy tax in addition to all the other state and local taxes is a viable solution. The Pennsylvania Association of Realtors will continue to perform extensive research on the issue of property tax reform, the implications on the real estate industry. We look forward to working with members of the state legislature to find a plan that best meets the needs of Pennsylvania homeowners and encourages home ownership for future generations. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss our findings. I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Herb. I believe our first question is Representative Boyden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, appreciate your testimony. Thanks for being here this morning. Um, as was spoken earlier uh, by prior members of the committee and testifiers, this, this uh, plan is a part of an evolution over the last, I'm going to say, at least six years or so. Um, prior elements or prior previous plans, um, House Bill 1275 and some other bills, Parr was an adamant opponent of the bill. Um, and at this point, uh, based on your testimony, you're taking a neutral stance on House Bill 1776. Is that correct? That's correct. We actually just did some preliminary survey work back on uh, last week, actually, just was completed. Uh, and we really are forming our information based upon that survey and data. I think some of the other bills that were mentioned talk about uh, increase in realty transfer tax and other things that would prove to be even a greater barrier for home ownership in Pennsylvania. Uh, yeah, one of the first uh, original plans had uh, dealt with or included the realty transfer tax, but another part of this whole issue is the vast majority of your members, I would imagine, are either sole proprietors or S corps, and as such, will end up p paying an increase in income tax. You're aware of that, correct? That's correct. Um, so. I guess my question is, and I want to be very direct, where do you anticipate your group coming out on this on this piece of legislation? In, in terms of your earlier comment, certainly we understand that it may have a far-reaching effect on our members, but really the work that we're doing is really about our consumers and the benefits of home ownership and what that effect might be with, re, with respect to reforming property taxes. Um, our group will be meeting in the next couple of weeks. We have our scheduled business meetings. As I mentioned in my testimony, we're actually going to be doing a lot more survey work and a lot more in-depth research about the subject matter. And so because of the timing of this and the timing of our meetings, uh, we haven't had the opportunity to pull our full group together, which we, do, we will be doing in about two weeks. Okay. I, I uh, look forward to seeing the results of that because I, I appreciated that you, you, know, you said specifically that your concern is how this would affect uh, um, you know, home ownership and the consumers and really people that ultimately you would represent in the transaction of purchasing uh, a property. Um, unfortunately, the way this place operates around here is most people are very parochial and uh, unfortunately they look at things as to you know how their ox is personally going to get gored when they look at specific pieces of legislation and I'm looking forward to uh, to perhaps uh, an affirmative stance from your your organization on this piece of legislation since the realty transfer tax has been backed out of it so I I'm hopeful that uh, that you'll see the light that this that this bill would encourage home ownership and I think that uh, from your standpoint that would be a tremendously positive benefit for the Association of Realtors. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We look forward to uh, sharing those results with you. And when you speak about home ownership, it really does have a positive impact on a community, on a neighborhood, on the school districts. Uh, the research is pretty profound as far as those effects of home ownership. Thank you, Representative Boyd. Representative Davidson. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony today. Uh, my question has to do with um, with home buying and um, selling. 
and uh, how you didn't mention in your in your report, but maybe you have some preliminary data as to how property tax uh, sales are affect property taxes are affecting home sales. I do have some anecdotal um, uh, data, which is homeowners testifying that they can't sell their homes because their taxes. Um, property taxes are $9,000 or $12,000, and people looking at that tax bill um, won't buy in the area, even though the homes are are beautiful and, and it's a well-kept neighborhood. Are, are you seeing that uh, across the state in, in areas that have high taxes um, being less desirable simply because of, um, of, of the property tax? I would agree with your comments. Certainly, as mentioned earlier, we're a very diverse state, and as such, disparity in terms of the property taxes vary so greatly across the Commonwealth. Uh, but I can personally relate to the specific areas that you speak of. And when you have an elevated uh, property tax, we have seen some taxes as high as twelve, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 on slightly above medium value properties. Um, that becomes a barrier for home ownership. It becomes a, a difficult task when you're looking at the amount of monthly income that can go towards home ownership, and if it's being absorbed by that taxation, it certainly affects what we call the affordability, uh, the affordability index as far as what a consumer can afford to purchase based upon those uh, elevated or higher property taxes. So to the answer your question, yes, it does have an effect. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Davidson. I was going to ask if you could provide a copy of the questions that were asked in that survey just for the membership's knowledge to compare what the answer is, that would be very helpful. Sure, we would be happy to meet with you at some uh, later time as well. Very good. Thank you. We appreciate your testimony and the good work you do here in Pennsylvania. Up, oh, I apologize. The late add-on was not adjusted to my new glasses. Representative Cox, you have a question. I know. What do you What do you want for three dollars? <laughs> Getting a lot of mileage out of those $3 glasses. Hey, I am great. I usually only pay a buck and a half, so. If you'd like to ask a short question, Mr. Cox, your time's burning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just for a quick question, do you have a, a rough percentage of how many Pennsylvanians are homeowners um, versus property owners? We've heard varying percentages out there on different property types, but it's kind of two questions. <laughs> Uh, we do have that data just to I don't have that with me and uh, we just came off of our national meetings in Washington So I have some national numbers on my tip of my tongue, but uh, out of the survey that was done 87% were homeowners But I believe your question spoke to out of the citizens of the Commonwealth how, what the, what the percentage of home ownership is and I can provide that exact number to you Okay, and on page two of your uh, testimony you make reference. I mean one one reference talks clearly about House Bill 1776, that type of broadened-based approach uh, on a statewide level. Um, was there a specific piece of legislation uh, focusing on that 56 percent that didn't want to give local governments the option of reducing taxes? So to I answer, to make sure I clarify your question, you're talking about the 56 percent that believe that giving local governments uh, the opinion was not favorable. Uh, we basically framed the question to ask out of the couple of different proposals that have been talked about. Uh, we were really trying to gauge the sentiment of the consumer, the citizen, to find out what they felt was a more palatable solution uh, and what that survey result reveals uh, was direct answer to those questions. Okay, so the, the local option, uh, I believe uh, the Democratic chair referenced past failures of approaches to shift on that local level. Would you say the sentiment then from your survey is saying that they still don't want to do a local level, they want a broader statewide approach? That's what our survey results. And actually, if you go back to the graph that was provided earlier, where they look at the 59%, that's compro comprised of a state or state and local issue versus a much smaller minority that think it should just be a local. And, and that was part of the graph provided and also in the testimony. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Chairwoman Monday has a question. Well, actually, it's a follow-up to Representative Cox's question because in your in your testimony, twice you you indicated uh, on the first page you say someone must give voice to the voters and homeowners, and then on the on the second page you talk about the voters are growing more and more weary of inaction by state government on property tax reform, and 
I've been working on this issue for 30 years. Um, I think in 1988, the overwhelming defeat of that referendum gave the legislature a very clear message that people were not ready for property tax reform. And so then in 1998, we said, okay, well, if you don't want to do it at the state level, let's do it at the local level. And we let school districts put a referendum on the ballot. Overwhelmingly defeated. Again in 2006, overwhelmingly defeated at the local level. So I guess my question is, what should we do on the state level, since you're not taking a position on the elements of 1776 or on any bill, as you say, what are the people of Pennsylvania looking for? Because from where I'm sitting, they've been very clear that they are not for a shift from property to sales and income. You can't just do it by sales tax. You have to include income taxes. So what are the people of Pennsylvania looking for? Because I don't see that we've been inactive. We, we've given them the opportunity three times through referendum. We instituted gaming. Uh, the only reason I voted for gaming was because of the property tax relief aspects of it. So tell me, please, what are, based on your survey, what are people looking for in terms of a solution other than just the elimination of a tax that they don't like? I, I think that, and I share some of the same scenarios that you have been through in the past and that we've certainly been a, been a part of, um, it seems clear to us, based upon the preliminary survey work that we completed, uh, that it that the sentiments of the constitu of the, your constituents and the residents of the Commonwealth are looking that it should be more of a state issue, barring the previous uh, bills that were out there and the referendums that were there. I think the you comment about the inactivity or inaction by the legislature, it just shows that the growing frustration uh, from our citizens has grown greater than what it's even been in the past, and the frustration of not doing something. And certainly I agree we've been back and forth on this issue uh, in terms of the legislator, in terms of uh, having various proposals that were out there. Uh, we intend to do additional survey work and follow-up work uh, on this uh, over the next couple of weeks. And again, we'll be happy to share our, our results with you. So you don't really know at this point what people are looking for as a substitute for the current system? Well, we know so far, based upon what I presented, that they believe it's, it, it's going back to a state issue. Uh, they definitely, what we do know from the survey results that we did complete uh, is that they are looking for some type of property tax reform, um, and they want to see it done. And again, uh, to actually have and bring back to you uh, more specifics, I think we'll be able to do some follow-up with you on that. We look forward to continuing to work on it. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your testimony on behalf of the Pennsylvania Realtors Association. Next, we will have Bernard Orvec from the uh, publishers, <coughs> Williamsport Sun Gazette. And uh, Deborah, are you going to join him? Yeah, good. Deborah Musselman, Director of Governmental Affairs for the Pennsylvania Newspaper Association. When you are comfortable, Hi. feel free to join us. Good morning. Thank you so much for, uh, for allowing us to appear today. I'm Deb Musselman, uh, Director of Government Affairs for Newspaper Association, <laughs> our publisher for the Williamsport Sun Gazette, um, Ber Bernard Oravik, is here with us today uh, to share our, our views on this issue. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairman Benninghoff and Chairwoman Mundy. I appreciate the opportunity to speak before the uh, Finance Committee today. Uh, my name is Bernard Oravik, Bernie Oravik. I serve as publisher of the Williamsport Sun Gazette, a daily newspaper published in Lycoming County since 1801. Uh, in addition to the Williamsport Sun Gazette, our company also owns the Altoona Mirror, Lewistown Sentinel, Lock Haven Express, and Muncie Luminary, as well as the, uh, the Warren newspaper. I'm here today, uh, probably be the first person to voice opposition uh, to portions of, if not all, of House Bill 1776. I am not a paid lobbyist or a political activist. I serve as a private sector CEO who hopes to share with you today how this bill will adversely affect our industry, my industry, 
as well as uh, some of the citizens that we serve. Uh, fortunately, on a daily basis, I have a lot of interaction with our readers, both online and in print. Um, it was interesting to note some of the some of the poll results we talked about earlier. Um, I could put a poll up tomorrow and have 100% uh, in opposition to real estate taxes. Then I can say, well, what if half of the taxes go to uh, go to a, a sales tax? Well, it'll drop to 50%. But the, the big uncertainty here with the people, especially our readers, is not what reform takes place, but how do we curb the spending to prevent those taxes from increasing, e either on a statewide or a local level? And that's something I'm going to get to a little bit later that I think I can help uh, answer the last question by uh, Representative Mundy. House Bill 1776 would impose a, sa a state sales and use tax at the rate of 7% on numerous goods and services not currently taxed in Pennsylvania by means of repealing exemptions found in the tax code. The bill would impose a tax on newspaper sales, production, and advertising. Most states do not charge the sales tax when consumers buy a daily or weekly newspaper, nor do they tax newspapers on their circulation revenue. PNA and I believe that such taxes are bad for business and bad for democracy in general. Sales and circulation taxes stifle the free flow of information. Newspapers report on events of state and national interest, government activities, and events in our own communities and around the world. Imposing a sales tax on newspapers amounts to taxation of information and free speech. Ideas should not and really should not be taxed. If one looks at the current news climate in the area, you'll notice that most news that you hear on the radio, on television, even online, is generated through newspaper reporting and newspaper posting. Uh, years ago, this maybe wasn't the case, but over the past 10 to 15 years, just about everything you hear now, with the exception of individual bloggers, is coming in one form or another from newspaper reporters. The cost of administrating and collecting a tax on newspapers would be high for a limited return. The tax would create an administrative hardship on thousands of newspaper carriers, including retirees who deliver newspapers to supplement their income, and a handful of boys and girls under age 18. As independent contractors for their local papers, they purchase the papers they deliver at a wholesale rate for delivery, and they sell them directly to the customer. These contractors would doubtlessly, would, would for sure lose customers if forced to collect a new tax, and would face a choice of absorbing the tax and losing income or serving as a tax collector for the state. Uh, one of the secrets about newspaper carriers that a lot of people don't realize is when most newspapers transferred from an evening format, an afternoon format, to a morning format about 30 to 40 years ago, at that time, 80% of our carriers were school-aged children who came home from school and delivered the local news. Today, with early morning delivery, 95% in my particular paper are between the ages of 45 and 65. So it's a completely changing demographic of delivery personnel, and most of these men and women do this as a preliminary or a supplemental income to go along with either their Social Security or some sort of pension. Many newspapers drive much, derive much of their circulation revenue from news rack sales. It would be impossible to adjust coin boxes to collect the sales tax, particularly with local county tax options in place. This would force newspapers to raise prices and absorb the cost of the tax. Declining sales and revenues would be a result here, and a very negative one. Um, one thing I do as a publisher, in addition to setting the tone of the paper and worrying about how much revenue I can bring in to keep the paper afloat, is I also have the power to hire and fire, create jobs, and eliminate jobs. And when there's a down economy, based on the recession of 08 and still the slow recovery, Often I have to sit down with employees and lay them off based on lack of work, especially lack of commercial printing. We used to print a lot more special publications other than newspapers. With recession, a lot of that has gone away, so I've had to lay off based on economic means. That's hard in and of itself, but I can justify that in an honest and responsible way. For me to go back to employees now and say, you're going to lose a job because we have to pay in more on taxes for newspapers that have never been, taxed in the, never been taxed in the place, in the first place, would make no sense. So it's very important. It is a job killer for us. Retailers lose a vital resource when newspaper circulation declines. Adding 7% or more to the cost of a newspaper, regardless of whether it's sold in a store, from a news rack, or by subscription, would reduce circulation and, in a devastating chain reaction, reduce the distribution of advertising by retail merchants who rely on newspapers to reach local customers and could harm local economies. 
a tax on advertising would have a significant adverse impact on newspapers and on society. The tax on advertising in this bill would not apply to, quote, business-to-business -business advertising, but is, it does not clearly define the term. Is the advertising circulated with a newspaper exempt because the advertiser has chosen to deal with another business, my local newspaper, or is it subject to the tax since it is distributed to the general public? Will the Department of Revenue decide this by regulation? If the purchaser of the newspaper and advertising is a business, does the tax on advertising apply? What about advertisements on internet websites? Florida tried to tax advertising in 1999 and repealed it less than one year later after discovering it was a regulatory nightmare. Singling out newspapers for a sales tax without imposing that tax on other information media, radio, TV, direct mail, and internet-only publications, is not only inappropriate but, in, but unfair. Newspapers already pay their fair share of taxes, including property tax, corporate net income tax, capital stock and franchise taxes, as well as other taxes imposed on businesses in general. Because the bill would curtail many regulations under the current tax code, it would also impose a sales tax on the cost of our raw materials, such as paper and ink. This would leverage the unfair advantage created in the bill for our media, com media competitors. Local community newspapers report on events of state and national interest, on government activity, and on events in the communities around the world. PNA notes the time honor status of our free press as the only form of business specifically identified in the United States Constitution. While I am here to specifically address concerns of the newspaper industry and to defend our right to publish free and clear of taxes, the larger picture cannot be overlooked. Raising taxes, creating new taxes, shifting taxes from one group of citizens to another will not solve the core problem of too much government, both local and statewide spending. We had talked earlier, Representative Mundy had asked the, the former gentleman, what do our taxpayers want? Well, no one can absolutely answer that question, but I can tell you one thing from sure from the, from the interactions I have with our readers. Many of them complain about their real estate taxes. None of them or I would, would, would want to pay real estate taxes if we had the choice. But the bigger concern over having to pay the taxes is not knowing year in and year out how much it's going to go up. Most of our readers, and I think most taxpayers, understand that paying real estate taxes has been and may well be a, a part of owning a home in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. A slight reduction in those taxes would go a long way. But more importantly, a reduction in spending and the certainty to know year in, year, in, year out, I have to worry about paying another hundred, then another hundred on top of my existing taxes. That certainty is what our taxpayers are looking for. And shifting tax burdens for the sake of shifting tax burdens is not the answer. It is also time to revisit the issue of school and municipal consolidation. For real and lasting cost reductions, we must address this issue very soon. We have 499 school districts in this Commonwealth within 67 states. That's 499 superintendents. Cut back to even 100 of those. Keep 100 for the 67 counties plus the larger urban areas. And you're saving just in salaries of superintendents alone close to $56 million based on an average of $140,000 a year. Small change when we're talking about billions, but there are other costs involved with that as well that can be saved. Not a popular or easy decision, not something that anyone wants to do. I think only about two, two uh, major consolidations have happened in the past few years, but it's something to look at. Otherwise, people in our community, in education, in other walks of business in Pennsylvania, are going to look at this uh, tax reform bill as, I dare say it, a slight way or an underhanded way to deny our school districts of revenue. And we don't want that to happen. Everybody here has the right view. They want to do what's best for the people of Pennsylvania. They want to do what's best for the taxpayers. But I think it's very important that we start with maintaining current rates or reducing them slightly, and more importantly, cutting spending going into the future. With that, I'd simply like to close that we consider any tax imposed on a sale of newspapers to be a tax on the free flow of information in our society and contrary to the public interest, and we oppose House Bill 1776. Please table or vote no on House Bill 1776 when the opportunity arises. Thank you. Thank you. Deb, do you want to add anything to that? No, thank you. Take questions? Okay. Any questions you have for the... Anyone? Yes, ma'am. Representative Davidson and Representative Cox. Would you still oppose the bill if um, the newspaper tax is taken out? 
uh, we would still question it, but that would certainly, you know, that, that's our one sacred ox, as the gentleman said. But, but overall, we do, we do have overall objections to it, to be honest with you. I mean, it's a combination, of course, our own. We're definitely looking at our own industry, but we are looking at, since we deal with the public daily, we deal with writers, we deal with people who call us, write us, and, and, con and confer with us on a daily basis, we do find that the biggest concern people have isn't so much the fact that they're paying real estate taxes. It's just every year it keeps going up, and the spending isn't curtailed. That's the problem that our, our taxpayers, our readers are facing. And I think uh, if you were to do a bill, a modification of the bill where you, you are able to save some real estate taxes and also make enough spending cuts state and locally that we can guarantee those things don't go up every year, um, I think it would be a lot easier sell. Um, I, you know, I, I disagree with some of the folks that went first. They have some good points, but I think overall the issue isn't shifting from real estate to sales tax. It's maintaining or lowering slightly existing taxes and not making them go up year after year, if that makes sense. Representative Cox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you for your testimony. Um, you talked to, briefly about a, a survey. Uh, you know, if you surveyed people, mm -hmm. would they not want to pay property taxes? Um, have you, in fact, conducted any surveys <clears throat> among your readership? Uh, one of the previous testifiers talked about a uh, survey done online. Another one was done, well, I think a couple of them were done online. Um, and there's, the public sentiment is, is high on this, and there's a mm -hmm. high number. Have you done a survey within your readership as far as laying out some of these parameters, much like the realtors have done, to say, if you take away this tax, and utilize sales and income tax. If you lay out a fairly phrased question, mm -hmm. do you know what your readers would say, or have you done this already? Oh, oh, no, I have. We haven't done it already. But I, I would, I would definitely say yes. They would want and say that they're paying too much in taxes. They'd want to see the taxes lowered. There's no doubt about that. I think the concern is you can't, you can't um, lay out the survey in such a way that you can explain to them, well, we can't guarantee the taxes somewhere else and expenses are going to continue to go up. If you were able to say that, you know, your taxes are going to go down this amount, but you may have to pick up a few extra dollars here for the sales tax, and that's not going to go up next year, or the main initiative we talked about a little bit here is your local districts still have the option to levy a local income tax if they need to make up the difference. I mean, if you put all that in there, that changes the dynamics. Um, plus, to be quite honest, a lot of the folks who, who, will, who will respond to online surveys um, tend to be tend to be generally um, uh, more politically active uh, in our neighborhood, uh, more generally conservative, and it's going to be a skewed result, kind of like choosing registered versus actual voters. Um, but, but either way, a, a poll is going to say, yes, please reduce my real estate tax. And I would vote, yes, please, redu please redu my, reduce my real estate taxes. But at the same time, we have to look at what's going to happen once the alternatives are put into place. And it's very difficult to guarantee any of our, our readers, our taxpayers, that their rate still isn't going to go up somewhere else next year, the year after, the year after. So I think, I think well, you've done a lot of work on this, and I like the idea we're thinking about saving money, trying to reduce taxes. I, I don't think we have to go as far on the whole as we're doing here. I think we have to figure out first, how do we curb and prevent the out of control spending, both locally and, and statewide on things such as education. There were so many un unfunded mandates, there's so many things going into it. And those costs, no matter how wonderful the plan may seem or whatever the plan might finally come out to be, it's all gonna be for naught if two years from now, the local real estate rate, or excuse me, the local earned income rate is going to have to keep going up, going up, going up to the point where you're going to end up paying more collectively, both in income and real estate taxes. Um, I, I would ask that you perhaps take take the time to do, as uh, I, I know at least one other newspaper off the top of my head, uh, Times Herald, uh, Stan Husky, mm -hmm. the gentleman, did a series of articles on this, and across those articles, he explained, you know, what's taxable and and I believe did a very thorough discussion of the ins and outs of the plan, and he put out what he called a property tax challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and I recently interviewed with him, and he handed me a stack of letters, and that was just a portion of what he had received, <laughs> over and over and over again. And this is the more traditional, uh, and I'm, this is going to the potentially skewed results of an online sure. online poll. Uh, KQV 
uh, wasn't just an online poll. It was also a telephone poll, uh, no pun intended. Um, but when you look at that type of, of response, a few people in the audience just got that. Um, <laughs> There's not a comedy tax, so we're okay. <laughs> fortunately. Yeah. Um, but when you look at that, uh, and, and Mr. Baldinger testified as far as going around to at least 50 different places in the last year alone, I've been around different areas. Other reps have been around in other areas. Uh, this is not an isolated issue from mm -hmm. the most conservative uh, voters are the most conservative responders. This is Republicans, Democrats, independents from all political, <clears throat> all political spectrums. <clears throat> and the common thread is they want home ownership. Mm -hmm. And so I would disagree with you that they're content to continue to pay rent to their school districts. They want to pay that last mortgage payment and they want to own it. Mm -hmm. They want to feel secure in their homes. Our own Department of Aging talks about aging in place. And yet our own tax system is pushing people out of their homes. And so if we're trying to address health care costs by letting people age in their homes, mm -hmm. shouldn't we tackle the thing that's driving them out of their homes the fastest? And so I, I'm not looking to get into I'm, a, I'm not a, a back and forth here, but mm -hmm. I, would, I would request that you perhaps put a series of articles out there explaining it mm -hmm. and, and give it fair treatment and, and say, you know, what, what would you like to see done? If you're doing this and doing this, you know, I, I would ask that you not just look at you know the the businesses or the uh, the carriers who are going to be delivering it and looking at whether they want to become tax collectors, but asking your readers as a whole, the general populace, what they think of this. And I think you'll be, uh, based on what I'm hearing today, I think you'll be surprised by the results because it's uh, it's a growing sentiment. And as the the realtors' information uh, displayed when given information about this in an open way, uh, the the results are overwhelming and they're continuing to grow in that direction. And, and, and I, I would love, I think we'll get together and I'll put something together and, and poll our folks with your help. Um, but but I, do, I do, again, I, th I think what you have to take out of this, I'm not disagreeing people want some kind of a tax reform. Everybody wants something to pay a little less. And I don't think it's, 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 it's a matter of people, of me trying to say no one wants tax reform. Of course they want tax reform. My concern is if you're going to have such an upheaval and you're going to change it this way, and you're not going to you're not going to act on the core problem, which is out of control spending. What are you accomplishing? You're robbing Peter to pay Paul, and both of them are poor. And this this will be my last comment. You're welcome to comment if you wish. But the the Republican uh, agenda thus far over the last couple of years, uh, since Governor Corbett came in, has been to tackle. Uh, those very issues to tackle the out of control school spending to to rein them in. We did some legislation last summer that uh, that pulls back on the ex the exemptions allowed uh, under the the tax increases, and so we are doing just that. We are trying to tighten the belt in every way possible, and and uh, and so I think uh, if, if you can get behind us with uh, on some of these other things, prevailing wage is another thing that just shackles school districts to artificial cost increases. Stay on, stay on the bill. Not to cut you short. But, I'm, I'm, I'm addressing the, the gentleman's concerns, Mr. Chairman. I All think right. a little latitude would be... the other people that are here waiting to testify, I'd like to stay on schedule, please. Okay. I appreciate the comments. Thank you, sir. Thank you, you two are welcome to have a sidebar, if you'd like, and set up that opportunity to get that survey together. Thank you, Chairman. Great. Representative Dean, I believe, has a question yet. I had a quick question. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your testimony, Mr. Orovec. Um, have you done an analysis of what is the dollar number impact, and maybe this is really more appropriately for Mr. Representative Cox, um, for uh, your industry across the Commonwealth? What does this represent in expansion of revenues? That is something we'd have to we, really point out. We actually haven't done um, a specific analysis per se. One of the reasons for that is um, a lack of clarity in the bill as to uh, the way the, the tax would be imposed if it would be paid at the newsstand, if it would be paid on newspaper circulation revenue, there's a lot of unanswered questions. And the advertising issue is, is a key yeah. as well. Um, if, if it's considered business to business, is advertising exempt? Uh, but because we sell to the public, is ag advertising then taxed, you know, as far as, as far as that option as well? So there's a lot of parameters we don't have an answer on yet to, to clearly give you a proper number. To know. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Uh, excuse me. Um, if I may add, um, the legislation in previous sessions uh, was just a blanket tax on advertising, and we do have data on that, on the impact 
on Pennsylvania and specific cities uh, that was done by um, Global Insight, the econometric study. And I'll be happy to get a packet of that information to you, Representative. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Dean. And thank you both for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, next we have Sherry Free, certified.